everybody. Um, as Zarar has said, I am Julia White, and I am the network rep for Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm easy. Um, Eastern Ontario rep and Quebec rep. Uh, donc, est de l'Ontario ainsi que le Québec. Il, lui, he, him pronouns. So uh, this panel is for peer voices, which is really important. I think a lot of us show up to these events, to the summits, and to Jack Chapters to connect with our peers. We learn a lot from each other, and we have really important conversations. Um, so this is a great opportunity to hold that space for our peers. Um, we've kind of we've decided to go with the theme of Next 10, continuing on that. So we are going to take this opportunity to reflect on the last 10 what we've learned, you know, what you're kind of taking from this um, opportunity, and then also discussing what our hopes and dreams are for the next 10. Um, so with that, I would like to invite our amazing panelists to join us on the stage. All right, so uh, just going down the line here, I will invite panelists to introduce themselves. Um, we will do the same, I guess, kind of format, your name, your pronouns, and where you are from. Wild. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Nikki Lumley. Uh, I go by he, him pronouns, and I am from St. Albert, Alberta. <laughs> Woo! Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm from Bonn, but uh, I currently go to the University of Guelph, uh, and I'm the team lead of the Jack.org Guelph chapter. Hi, my name's Letitia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from St. John's, Newfoundland. Woo! Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle Emmerich. Je suis il lui en français, they, them, in English, and I'm from Montreal. All right, so getting right into it, our first question for the panelists is, what is one positive change you have seen in the last 10 years pertaining to mental health? So this can be anything really you can think of, something big, something small. It can be just within your own community, your school. It can be something nationwide, global, whatever you would like to discuss. So Nikki, you can take it away. Wild. Um, Yeah. You're going to find out that my favorite word is wild. It, I don't say um, I do, but like wild is my um. Uh, so, <laughs> wild. Okay, uh, so I think um, the biggest change I've seen, um, I work with a lot of youth, and one thing I've really noticed is they are much more vocal about like expressing their mental health and at least like expressing the desire or need to take um, wellness days um, than I ever experienced when I was their age. Uh, so, like, especially um, with high schoolers, which is who I primarily work with, uh, I definitely noticed that, I don't know, they seem more open to explaining their needs of um, if they're feeling stressed or anxious. And it's really... It makes me feel happy because when I was their age, I didn't have that necessary, like, comfort to speak about it just because uh, teachers, like, they, they were definitely open to, like, if I needed that, but, like, it wasn't a known thing. Like, peers around me didn't do it. The person, like, that would do it, like, there'd be, there'd be, like, a little bit of looks or, like, ooh, that's not something that's really talked about, um, even when I was, like, in elementary or junior high. So it's really nice to see, especially, and I also noticed, like, teachers are, like, accepting it a bit more in my community, and it's just, it's a really nice change to see, for sure. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, one of the other biggest changes I would say I've seen is that we've expanded the idea of what it means um, to struggle with your mental health. And I feel like uh, in the past, it wasn't really understood that everyone has mental health, but I've definitely seen a huge shift in terms of acknowledging that we all have mental health. Um, but that also means we all can struggle with our mental health and we're all capable of improving our mental health. Um, I feel like 10 years ago, there was a really like narrow idea of what a mental health struggle looks like. And so if people didn't fit that specific mold, then it 
they weren't heard. Um, and obviously, we still have uh, lots of progress to be made, but I think we're definitely expanding um, these ideas of, of what it means to work on your mental health, and that's kind of being open uh, to more people. Um, and like my community at the University of Guelph, even, we developed this program called Shine, where you can uh, do like one-on-one -on -one um, peer to peer developing your wellness skills, which I think is super cool because in the past we had um, these programs to develop like your academic skills or your learning skills. Um, and now that's kind of been expanded into developing mental health and wellness skills, which kind of just shows that we all have mental health and, and we can all work on our mental health. So I would say that's kind of one of the biggest shifts I've seen. Yeah, I definitely agree where mental health has been growing so much. And for me personally, 10 years ago, um, I was in elementary school. I think I was like eight years old. And I know that in early childhood education or your early elementary years, um, when I was in elementary school, it was kind of like when you had an emotion, if you could not sit still in a classroom, your emotions weren't really being validated. And I feel like even through conversations I've had with people in education today, there has really been such an emphasis on early childhood education about mental health and being able to communicate your feelings and validating that. So I really feel like once you're able to tell children from a young age, you know, that their feelings are okay, this is how you express your emotions, and you're really bringing mental health to the forefront from a young age, it's really working towards ending the stigma. And, you know, having the next generation of future leaders who are ready to talk about their mental health and really, you know, ending that stigma from within. So definitely that shift that Mental health isn't just an adult issue, it affects people from all ages and even just familiar, familiarizing yourself from it, you know, right from kindergarten, early elementary school. I feel like that's such a crucial and essential part of the education system. And I'm so fortunate that we have, you know, some like young teachers and everyone in the audience today who's kind of working towards creating that platform for the next leaders of our, you know, of the mental health revolution. So just to jump in, to do a translation for the question. Uh, Emrys, you can answer in English or French, but for the people that are watching us online, the question in French was, quel est un des plus gros changements qu'on a pu voir dans les deux dernières années lorsqu'on parle de santé mentale? Donc, Emrys, je te laisse la parole. Ben Moi, similairement à ce que Letty a dit, dans le fond, c'est vraiment d'avoir vu comme dans le milieu scolaire, soit primaire, secondaire, vraiment maintenant, on en parle beaucoup plus comme la normalisation du fait que euh, certains jeunes ont beaucoup d'anxiété, il y a beaucoup de jeunes qui vont avoir des traités TDAH, etc. Puis on va plus en parler, mieux éduquer les professeurs par rapport à ça, comment gérer quelqu'un qui, qui est dans sa classe, euh, qui a, qui a des, des problématiques euh, similaires. Et donc vraiment, comme quand moi j'étais au primaire, ou genre le début de mon secondaire, c'était vraiment pas la même chose. J'ai vraiment vu l'évolution se passer pendant mon secondaire. Comme en secondaire 1, les gens, on parlait vraiment pas de santé mentale ou de choses comme ça. Puis vers mon secondaire 5, on était rendu à avoir des ateliers informatifs sur l'importance de comprendre la dépression, comprendre l'anxiété. Euh, C'est quoi la dépression saisonnière? Quelque chose d'assez important au Canada. Euh, donc, c'est vraiment voir euh, l'information grandir sur ça. Ça a vraiment comme... Thank you. Thank you. I think a lot of what we can agree on is that the stigma has really changed rapidly over the past 10 years. So I just want to take a minute to say if you're here, if you are participating in these conversations, if you're putting in the work, you have been a part of that and you, you know, definitely have a role in changing the stigma. So give yourself a little pat on the back. Give your friend a little pat on the back. You know, this is what we're all here for and we're starting to see it. Thank you. We're, we're starting to see, you know, our efforts be realized. Um, so with that, we will go to question number two. What is one lesson that you have learned about mental wellness within the past 10 years? Donc, quelle est une des leçons que vous avez appris par rapport à la santé mentale dans les dix dernières années? Ah, um, okay. <laughs> uh, I feel like for me, definitely one thing I have learned is how different uh, mental health struggles look for every single person. Um, when, especially because when I was younger, I went through struggles and in my head, I know now that it was 
not a great thing to think. But in my head, I would always think, well, I'm seeing all these people, like, and, like, they're really struggling. And, like, mine looks nothing like that. So, obviously, that's what mental health struggles look like, which means I'm not going through a mental health struggle. See, that wasn't a logical thing, but in my head, it was logical um, until I got to high school. And again, that's when I slowly started seeing more people express their um, struggles and like their anxiety and other things that they're going through. And I noticed that every single time I talked to someone, it looked completely different. But every single time in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, that's completely valid. And then one day, it just kind of like hit. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Why am I saying everyone else is valid, but I'm not saying myself? I'm not saying I'm valid. That makes zero sense. And that's kind of when I started like my mental health advocacy um, journey is when I kind of realized, hey, maybe I was wrong for like six, seven years of my life um that's that's a fun revelation uh <laughs> uh but like it's it it was really helpful to just to kind of learn because you know what it just helps me understand people better it helps me understand myself better and it helps me love people more because like if i can um give everyone the amount of love that i always do why can't i give it to myself you know Uh, I love that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I feel like this is a hard one that I've learned so many things over the years. Also, I'm learning a lot over the years. But one of the biggest things I would say um, is that mental health isn't linear. Um, I feel like I used to have this idea that when someone struggles with their mental health, um, you know, they just, they, they work on it, everything gets better. And then they've, you know, quote unquote, like achieved mental health, and then it's all smooth, smooth sailing from there. Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, and through my own struggles with mental illness and my own struggles and uh, listening to so many people around me, I've learned that mental health is not a linear journey and that that's totally okay. And what works at some point uh, in your life may not be the same strategy that works later on. Um, and again, that that's totally okay. It just means like building kind of your tools so that you can cope with things better or differently in the future. Um, I like to kind of think of it just like with physical health, you might, you know, have great physical health at one point and then you get an injury and you have to focus more on that aspect of your uh, physical health um, and then things kind of go back to your normal, um, we should be looking at it the same way for mental health. So maybe your mental health is going great and you experience a big life stressor or something happens or nothing happens, it just fluctuates. Um, and maybe something that you used to cope in the past isn't working as well. It doesn't mean you failed. Um, and that's something that I try to remind myself as well. Just because something doesn't work in the moment, it doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that you um, um, get to learn new strategies that you can uh, pull from in the future again. And ultimately, because it's not linear, it's just uh, a matter of constantly checking in with yourself, checking in with those around you, um, and kind of building those skills and resources together so that when things do happen in the future, um, you have more to pull from and uh, kind of just to help you be more resilient. So that's one of the things that I've learned. I definitely agree with that. And I feel like one of the biggest things that I've learned about mental health over the years is that I'm someone who's, li who's lived all over the country. And it's the fact that being able to access mental health resources and get that support looks so different for all Canadians, you know, regardless of what community you're in, if you live in an urban city, a rural setting. And I feel like it's so easy sometimes for us to come here and speak about mental health from a place of privilege where we're able to access those resources and have that support in our life. So one of the biggest things that I've realized is that while we strive for equality and mental health resources, kind of not putting Canadians in that general basket case and kind of striving for equity because there are some communities, people of marginalized populations or remote communities who need that extra support, they deserve to have those extra resources. So I feel like when we even think about Canada, you know, being a first world country that has so many resources, the fact that they're not being equally allocated, it's such an injustice. And it's just so easy to forget that Sometimes you are coming from that place of privilege and you have to be very mindful and very aware that not everyone is coming from the same position that you are. And, you know, even in the last 10 years, we've worked so hard to create that equality for everyone. You know, organizations like Jack.org, that's really keeping everyone in the picture. 
So I really feel like the work that we're doing to make mental health accessible for all Canadians is so important and it's such a crucial thing. Um, you know, we've gone through a pandemic, we've gone through so many different things over the past 10 years. And I know that there's still so much more work that we're all, you know, striving for as advocates and everything. But I'm really fortunate that we're able to create those resources for all Canadians and really continue advocating for those underrepresented communities who are equity seeking. Euh, quelque chose que moi j'ai appris et que je continue à apprendre encore euh, en rapport avec la santé mentale, c'est qu'il n'y a rien de trop petit. Vraiment, euh, j'ai eu beaucoup de, de difficultés avec des idées noires très jeunes et je m'étais souvent dit que c'était comme rien, que ce n'était pas grave parce que ce n'était pas constant, ça, va, ça venait, ça allait. Um, et donc, j'ai vraiment l'impression, j'ai aussi beaucoup d'amis qui me, qui me parlaient d'avoir des, des difficultés, de l'anxiété ou de la dépression, etc. Puis, qui se rabaissaient tout le temps à dire « Ah oh non, mais c'est pas si grave. Genre, ah non, mais c'est pas... pas... » Comme je, je, je fais mes devoirs pareils, j'ai eu des bonnes notes pareilles, donc c'est pas grave. Mais si c'est assez pour que ça t'affecte, moi, je trouve que c'est ça peut être assez grave pour aller chercher de l'aide. Euh, et c'est quelque chose qui, qui est difficile à faire, ça prend beaucoup de courage, mais euh, je trouve que c'est quand même important. Thank you guys so much for that insight. I mean, again, just reiterating that we're all here to learn from each other. And yes, we have some amazing and, you know, very well-known keynote speakers and guests, but we're, we're all, you know, we all have something to bring to the table. So thank you guys for, um, you know, sharing uh, some of the lessons that you guys have learned. Um, so with that, we will dive into the next 10. So um, what is one change that you would like to see in the next 10 years? So again, this can be something big, something small within your own community. It can be nationally, you know, it can be within healthcare, maybe within education system, political, whatever your heart desires. Donc, quel est un des changements que vous voudriez voir dans les dix prochaines années? Pardon? Euh, ça peut être au niveau politique, au niveau social, au niveau communautaire, au niveau individuel, au niveau personnel. Euh, la parole est à vous. Awesome. Uh, I love this question. Uh, I, and I have like 50 different like answers for it. <laughs> so like I had to figure out which one I wanted to do. And I think I know which one. Um, so if you don't, if you haven't figured it out, I'm a very theatrical person because I love theater. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but there is definitely a lot of mental health stress and struggles when it comes to theater, especially when it comes to working with directors um, and just overall as feeling of sometimes you're being used. Um, and like this has been definitely discussed before as if there is a movement called the Me Too movement um, that basically were um, women actors who were either emotionally or sexually abused by directors, um, basically being like, you have to do this to get the part. You want the part, don't you? Um, and it's, it's an amazing movement and like, it's definitely really important, but there is still so much, I don't want to say toxic, but definitely toxic. Um, <laughs> like, people in theater running theater still and like there is a um instagram page that actually is like private and anonymous like submissions about so many actors um just kind of confessing like all the things that like happen to them that affect their mental health like i've seen um posts about people who are like throwing up from how much stress and pressure they are in rehearsals like they are going into like a 13 hour rehearsal and then have to do like a two and a half hour show right after that get like five minute break to eat and then do another show um and it's not healthy and it genuinely needs a change and from even my own personal experiences i know i've had I've been grateful to have so many amazing directors and people that I have worked with that I love dearly. I've also had um, a few people where I would be like, hey, I'm really struggling right now. Um, I'm going to have it all like 
fine before the um, show, but I need to take this day for myself. And I got screamed at for missing a single rehearsal because of my mental health. And I don't work with that person anymore. And a lot of people that I know don't work with that person anymore because that's not, that's not okay. Um, mental health genuinely needs to come first. Like, I think that's for school, work, theater, anything. It should always come first. And if you have someone that you are working with that doesn't accept that, if it's possible for you, get out of that situation because it's not healthy. It's not good for anyone. And honestly, they also need to learn that their actions and their thoughts on mental health need to change. And I really want to see a change, especially in the theater community. Um, I also have a, yeah, a few different answers for this, but I'll try to uh, keep it short. Um, one of the biggest changes I want to see um, is decreasing the stigma for a wider variety of mental health concerns. Um, I feel like as a society, we've, we've come um, a long way in terms of talking about certain mental health struggles, like whether it's, you know, stress and anxiety. Um, but I think there's still a lot of stigma and shame attached to so many other uh, presentations of mental health concerns, whether it's schizophrenia or personality disorders, eating disorders. There are so many mental health struggles that are just not talked about. And I feel like we shouldn't just be opening these conversations up to a certain kind of person or a certain kind of struggle. These should be conversations for everyone. Uh, and so I hope that in uh, yeah, the next 10 years, we see that the space is being open for everyone's experiences, regardless of their experiences, because uh, no one should feel silenced or ashamed no matter what their experiences are. So that's what I hope to see. Um, and kind of along that same note, I hope to kind of see that like breakdown of those systemic barriers that prevent people from being able to um, work on their mental health. Um, I know that um, at like the University of Guelph, we had the chance to work on something called the campus assessment tool, which kind of looked at um, yeah, <laughs> it's super awesome. We got to look at all the mental health resources and services um, at, uh, our, at the University of Guelph and see kind of strengths, weaknesses, people's perceptions of them. And we learned that even though our school has come a really long way in terms of the mental health resources, they're still really in inaccessible for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. There's financial barriers, there's cultural barriers, there's like the toxic productivity culture that makes people feel like they have to be on the brink of a crisis before they're, you know, a, quote unquote, allowed to reach out. Um, there's a long wait times and all of these things make it so that only certain types of people or certain experiences, um, those people are able to access mental health resources and that shouldn't be the case. They should be open up, open to everyone. Um, and that means kind of broadening uh, what it means uh, to struggle with someone's mental health. Um, and something that was cool as a result of that is that we were able to talk to like our administration and talk about um, what students perceive are and why these barriers are in place and hopefully we can see um, this is just like on our community scale but hopefully we can um, see that that access is being is being spread and, and made um, equal and equitable for everyone regardless of their, their experiences because I don't think anyone should be ostracized or left out of that conversation it's so important that no matter what someone's experiences are that they're able to access that mental health support so that's what I hope to see. <laughs> I definitely agree. This was such an all-encompassing question. So I definitely feel like one big thing is that you don't have to be sitting up here on a stage to be a mental health advocate or a mental health ally. I feel like it should be something that's kind of being ingrained in all communities. Like we talk about so many other, you know, physical body illnesses so openly. You know, everyone gets involved in that conversation. They're aware about it. And it's really not a big deal to be talking about it. So just the idea that it doesn't take a lot to be an advocate or an ally, you know, even just supporting your community and supporting members of your community with their mental health in the small ways. Um, that makes them feel so much more comfortable. And it's such an easy way for everyone to get involved in the conversation, you know, whether that's attending summits like this one or learning about resources yourself. But while we strive for everyone to access those resources, making sure they're readily available for everyone, it shouldn't be a whole task if you want to learn about mental health. If you just want to know the basics about and get involved in that conversation, you shouldn't be jumping through hoops to do so. And especially when we do talk about like equity seeking individuals like you were, 
you know, really putting an emphasis on resources for that. Across Canada, there are so many different communities. And the fact that some of them have to work harder just to receive the same care, uh, mental health care, it's completely unfair. And I feel like if we were just ingraining it more into our society and making it an everyday conversation, it would be easier for them to access those resources and kind of break those barriers. So I definitely feel like we should just be working on ingraining mental health care and mental health conversations in our everyday conversation and making it, you know, just like any sort of physical body disorder. Euh, dans les dix prochaines années, c'est sûr que, comme les autres participants ont dit, j'ai plein de plein d'idées, plein de choses qui, qui, qui me viennent en tête. Mais pour quelque chose de plus précis, spécifiquement en rapport avec les services de santé euh, québécois, qui est mon, mon expérience personnelle, mon monde, etc., euh, j'aimerais voir euh, plus d'informations chez les professionnels de la santé sur la réalité transgenre. Parce que c'est vraiment euh, une problématique qui... Euh, et, et là, vraiment, et quand on, on marche dans un système où est-ce que ça va par coup de huit rendez-vous et qu'on en passe trois à s'expliquer à notre thérapeute et à devenir le pamphlet d'éducation euh, de notre thérapeute, ben on, il nous en reste cinq pour nos problèmes. Fait que c'est sûr que c'est c'est un peu complexe aussi. On peut tomber sur toutes sortes de personnes. Euh, personnellement, j'ai déjà eu des expériences un peu moins euh, moins le fun, j'irais même jusqu'à dire transphobe, mais bon. Euh, donc, c'est sûr que dans une situation où est-ce qu'on est soit en crise, soit proche d'une crise où on a vraiment besoin d'aide, c'est pas nécessairement le, le moment de, de faire l'éducation de tout le monde à, à qui on a à parler. Euh, donc, j'aimerais vraiment voir plus de formation, plus de, de choses comme ça pour ces professionnels de la santé-là qui probablement ne demandent qu'à apprendre. Euh, et qui sont probablement très ouverts d'esprit à, à ça. C'est juste que, justement, c'est quelque chose qui n'a pas été fait encore et j'ose je, je, espérer qu'on qu va y arriver, dans le fond. Yeah, I'd love to hear some snaps and claps and yelling out in the audience. We love to see it. Uh, I just want to echo what Nikki said. Like, I love this question so much and I think that Again, it's it's what we're all here for is the future and, you know, to kind of envision what do we want the state of mental health to look like in the next 10 years. So I really just want to encourage you guys to all continue this conversation, which I'm sure has been started long before this panel. Uh, but just continue talking about that. I'm a big believer that, you know, you need to envision what you want. So we need to talk about it, speak it into existence kind of thing. Um, and with that, it kind of brings me to my next question which is a similar vibe but more personal uh what is one goal you would like to set for yourself in the next 10 years so this can be something personal it can be something you you know want to work on within your own life or it can be something that's more professional related to your advocacy work um again whatever um resonates with you most at this time donc quel but avez-vous pour euh pour vous-même en fait dans les euh, 10 prochaines années ça peut être des buts personnels des buts euh corporatif, début communautaire, ça peut être début de toutes sortes, parce qu'on sait que le, le, le monde de la santé mentale est très gros, très vaste. Donc, qu'est-ce qui, pour vous, est une priorité euh, personnellement dans les dix prochaines années? Wild. <rire> so, um, I think... I think for me, what I really want is to help my community create a um, mental health like hub specifically um, geared towards youth. Uh, currently, uh, my city, they, they don't, let's be honest, they don't even have a specific place for youth to meet up or hang out, period. There's like the library, there's the mall, which our mall, mall is very small. Um, And, like, other than those two places, there's nowhere. I mean, they can meet at the park if they want, um, but there's nothing. And, it's, and like, I work with – I work at the city of St. Albert, and um, this has definitely been a conversation that has come up time and time again. But nothing ever happens about it. And, like, until very recently, there has now become a um, – let's – it's called like a mental health a mental health 
hub for youth. And we're hopefully, um, I'm on this team to create this um, environment where youth can just like come in, hang out, have like a wellness break from whatever is struggles they have at the moment. And it, it also has like, it'll hopefully have resources for um, counseling um, or any just help that they might need at the current moment. And right now I am really pushing for it. There are a few people that are, it's very early in the works, um, but like there's a few people who are pretty pessimistic about it on the team. I don't, I don't know if that's spilling tea, but like, <laughs> um, but I am just constantly going to these meetings and being like, no, this needs to happen. Because I remember being a youth. Like, basically, if you wanted to do anything fun, you have to drive out to Edmonton. Like, and like, sure, it's like a two minute drive to get to Edmonton, but anything fun takes like 20 minutes. And youth don't, youth half the time don't know how to drive or they don't have a car yet. So, like, how is that fair? Now they have to use public transport, which is a whole other issue. I'm not going to go into my rant on the public transport for Edmonton. If you live in Edmonton, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's just, it, it makes zero sense that you have to go to a completely different city just to do something with your friends. So this is something that needs to happen. And the fact that they are putting an emphasis and also having resources for mental health at this, um, whatever it looks like, uh, is something that means so much to me. And I'm so excited to be a part of it and have in the next 10 years, Hopefully, it will be fully crafted, and we will have something for youth to go to. Um, I think for me, so I'll be graduating um, from my undergrad this year, which is kind of wow. wild to use uh, your word. Um, but I think something I want to do is to just continue my mental health advocacy um, in wherever I end up, whether it's post-grad studies or um, in my career, because I feel like um, my like Jack chapter at the University of Guelph has become like a second family to me and I've become so comfortable with them, but I don't want to, uh, and I don't want to leave university and not continue the work that I've been doing and, and continue learning uh, about all the amazing things that I've learned uh, through like Jack.org. And so it, ideally, in the future, I do want to work in the mental health field directly because it's through those like direct conversations that I've been able to have that's kind of shown me where my passion is. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm like bringing other people's ideas to those like, you know, those more like adult roles, um, because I feel like a lot of these conversations are like spearheaded by youth, which is obviously so amazing. Um, but I don't want to just like you know, graduate and then not take that with me. I want to implement those things that I've been learning and continue to learn from other people uh, into whatever uh, role that I am in. Um, and also on a bit of a more like personal side of things, um, I want to make sure that I continue prioritizing my mental health because uh, especially as I go through like a lot of changes and a lot of unknowns, um, I need to uh, remind myself that in order for me to accomplish the goals that I do want to accomplish, whether it's like career goals or like relational goals or just like the goal of like being like happy, like just things like that. I need to make sure I'm prioritizing my mental health because if I don't do that, then I can't do all those other things that I want to do. So that's just something that I want to make sure I kind of keep stay on top of, especially as I do go through a lot of changes um, uh, after uh, I graduate this year. But those are just kind of two sides of it. Yeah, I love preaching self-care. I love that for you. Uh, um, yeah, so I feel like everyone here, we're all part of so many different communities and who we identify with. So one of my kind of big goals for the next 10 years, it's a bit specific, but I really want to work on developing resources and mental health support for women who are newcomers to Canada who may be suffering from postpartum depression. Um, it's just something that's really personal to me because my own mom, she was like quite young when she had me. She was 25, so I think that's like still a youth. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely still youth definitely still youth um but yeah um I feel like um you know upon like my own research and kind of you know diving on the academic side of that either women who come here with they might not have the same 
resources or the same knowledge as everyone else. And I feel like they're such an underserved um, community. And just with my own lived experience, you know, kind of seeing what my mom went through and kind of how it still affects her today. It's definitely something that I just want to work on developing because especially Canada, when we pride ourselves on being so multicultural, part of that is that you have to accept responsibility on providing, you know, these newcomers Canada with the resources and the right tools that they need. Yeah, so that's definitely just been one of my goals. And I feel like there are so many different ways to address that, whether that's through like political systems or financial means or just developing the resources and developing the resources is one aspect of it, but then actually making sure that it's being delivered to them. Because so many women report that they feel like they don't have the words in English to report how they're feeling. They don't know how to access it. There are financial barriers. They might not have a car. They might not have transportation to get there. So just having the resources but not making it accessible for them to use it, that's just another thing that we have to combat. And um, it's just something that really like hits close to home with me. I know that there are so many like other newcomer women to Canada who are experiencing the same thing and they don't even know like the words to call it postpartum depression or anything similar like that. So I feel like when we cater specific resources to these individuals, you know, it's going to help, it's going to help them tremendously and it's going to help them contribute back to their communities and their children are going to lead a better quality of life. And it's a whole chain reaction and just really being there for these women because like when, when my mom first came to Canada, you know, she was really giving back to her community and really getting involved in everything. But sometimes it's the fact that your community has to support you back just because you're doing so much. I feel like having that same respect and just paying it forward to these other communities is so important. And when you start focusing in on one community, there are so many other communities that can start, you know, getting the awareness and having resources built out for them. So I truly do believe that it's such a chain reaction. And also on that note of this question, if you have any other next gen goals, go like write them up over there. I saw a few people up there and I want to see more of you guys up there. But thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Le mien est un peu plus personnel. Moi, personnellement, vraiment, quand j'ai lu la question, la première chose que j'ai, à quoi j'ai pensé, c'est ça fait longtemps que j'y travaille. Je vais probablement y travailler pour toujours, mais je, je veux prendre soin de moi. Uh, un esprit sain dans un corps sain, all that. Um, vraiment, j'ai, j'ai, je tiens à être une, un bon ami pour les gens que j'aime, à être une, un support pour ma famille, etc. Uh, donc, c'est vraiment une de mes priorités. Uh, c'est quelque chose à, à quoi je pense relativement assez souvent et qui, qui, que je devrais essayer de mettre plus de l'avant uh, dans la vie en général. And I'm going to say this, this uh, next part in English because... Uh, one of my broader goals is definitely to bring more francophone people to jack.org. <laughs> Facts. Yes. Uh, my friend, my dear friend and I uh, have been feel have been feeling so welcome. You guys have been amazing. Uh, it's absolutely great to feel like there is really um, an, a hand reaching for us and you guys want us to be here and it feels amazing. Uh, and I do feel like uh, maybe because Jack.org has been such a primarily Anglophone um, uh, organization, not a lot of people in Quebec even know of it, which I, I feel is, is the situation. And I feel like everybody would just be so in love with this. <laughs> so I cannot wait to just head back to Montreal and tell every single person that I see. I will. <laughs> I agree with that are all so amazing. I'm blown away. So I just want to say, hearing you all talk about, you know, the things you're passionate about, what you want to work on in the future, it makes me so proud to be up here with you all. It makes me proud to be a part of this network. You know, the work that we're all doing here together, everyone has their own community that they represent, their own experiences, and that's what makes Jack.org so beautiful and makes us so efficient and be able to make so much change, right? Um, so thank you all so much for your insight today and for being here. And like I said, you know, representing the communities and the experiences that you've had. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree that the next 10 years is looking amazing for youth in the mental health sphere, for the members of the Jack.org network. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's hear it for the next 10.